Okay. So we're starting, um, starting a new section today on evolution. Um, so I'm not here to um, get you to go to the Creation Museum, but it might make you laugh. Um, I went there uh, not this last summer, but the summer before. I was in Kentucky um, and across the Ohio River in, in Cincinnati, and um, and I just thought it would be fun. That's all. So, um, and it, it, they, God, they really, they really soaked you. It's like thirty bucks to go to this creation museum that teaches you a whole bunch of nutty things. Um, there's me underneath a, a dinosaur. Um, it's really cool. Um, um, let's see, there's me and my friend um, underneath a, some mammal. I think it is. No, it's probably some dinosaur, actually, also. Um, and I bought some stuff, including this hat and this shirt. Right? So, creation is it's great. I'm telling you, the Earth is only a little more than 6,000 years old. Um, and they even built an ark in another place right down the road. So you can actually go to the ark as well, you know, where, um, what was it, Jonah? No. Joshua, what? No, Noah. Noah, that's right, yeah, good old Noah. The earth flooded in. He put, but why did he, the thing is he put two of everything because of sex, right? But what about things that don't need sex to reproduce? And then, like, a paramecium, paramecium are these little um, single-cell microorganisms. They have thousands of sexes. Did they, did they put a whole bunch of little paramecium with different sexes? I, I don't understand. Okay, so. One thing, um, who um, who looked at the who watched the movie I asked you to watch? No one. Right? Why evolution is true? No one asked that. No one saw that. What the hell is wrong with you guys? I mean, I sent out an email, didn't I? Yes, I did. Um. Okay. Uh, I'll just go through this quickly. Um, okay, you know, there's a, a lot of people, for some reason, who think that um, they have a problem with evolution. Like, that organisms have a change through time. Some of them are creationism people. That means a young earth, 6,000 plus years old, instead of 4.5 billion. Um, people have, don't like the idea that, um, we're, people say we're related or descended from monkeys. No. We shared our most recent common ancestor with other primates. With chimps, we shared our most recent common ancestor about, oh, seven uh, million years ago, not that long. Um, plus there's been a whole bunch of homonyms that have been found in the fossil record. Um, so, I guess, you know, we're supposedly, um, we created God in our image. No, it's the other way around, right? Is that what it is? We didn't create God in our image, he created us in his. It's the other way around, actually. The truth is that we created God in our, our image. Um, I got it. God's not a mole. That'd be a bummer. I don't know. Moles aren't very pretty. Um, the Creator, supposedly, of course, God, He's perfect, right? Uh, omnipotent and omniscient. All seeing, all doing. Of course, if you're all seeing, you don't need to be omnipotent. 
or if you're omnipotent, you don't need to be all seeing because you can just change things around. But anyway, um, what is what part of you is not perfect? Just think of something that might um, something that wouldn't be good for you if it were to happen, or something that's about you that's of no use. Huh? Huh? Having to pee. Having to what? Pee. <laughs> pee. Piss. Piss. Urinate. Urinate. Oh. Well, I know. You don't like to urinate? God, I love to. <laughs> My bladder gets full and I just, oh, fuck. Oh. But, you bring up a good point. And that is, as men get older, their prostate enlarges. I don't know why. I mean, you'd think God would have done something about that. Um, and as it enlarges, it's also in a place where it actually squeezes the urethra from which our urine travels from our bladder out, right? And so instead of being able to pee like, ah, it's more like a little dribble here, a little dribble there. Now, is that a good engineering. Is that good engineering? No. 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 If God is intelligent, let's say an intelligent designer, why would he do that? Well, maybe just to give men a hard time if they live long enough. Maybe that's the whole reason, I guess. Okay. Um, so, another thing is if God created everything, then why did things go extinct? I don't understand that. Why are there fossils of extinct organisms that kind of indicate that perhaps life is older <coughs> than 6,000 plus years ago? Well, some people have said, God put it there to test us. So if we really believe in God, we won't... We'll say, oh, that's just God putting fossils there to mix us up. Secondly, or it could be the devil. <clears throat> Satan put um, fossils there to tempt us. Okay. Uh, why do humans choke? That's another good example of something that's not really perfectly designed. Anybody know what vestigial traits are? Okay. Um, our tailbone is a vestigial trait. Oh, so like our tonsils and our, the little extra thing in your intestines, right? Uh, appendix. Uh, appendix, perhaps, yeah. So like useless body parts? Yeah. Okay. Things that used to be, if you actually look at, we'll go over this, but if you actually look at like um, a whale, you'll actually see that whales have um, a pelvis. They don't need a pelvis with two little buds on it where there used to be legs. In fact, some whales occasionally are born with legs. Okay? That's kind of creepy. Um, so a vestigial trait is a trait that is no longer there because it had a previous function, but it's no longer used. Or it's used for a new function. Okay. So, um, there's all these M plus, same sort of thing with our genes. There's, there's genes um, in our genome that um, are, no, are now non-functional. Okay, so I, I guess I've kind of been um, maybe getting people mad about this God thing. Look at, actually I would never tell someone not to believe in God. I wouldn't. That's, you can actually, there's a lot of people who believe in God and they don't have a problem with evolution. The Catholic Church, for one. Okay. Um, so, I'm not presumptuous in thinking, oh, you know, there is no God. Or, there's, you shouldn't believe in God. You can do as you want, and if it helps you out, I mean, look at life is kind of a, can be rough at times, and it's nice to have, you know, some friend um, on your side, let's say. Um, the only thing is, religion tends to do things that, um, like, before the Catholic Church actually um, 
uh, started accepting science. Uh, they, uh, anybody who believed that the Earth was not the center of the universe, um, it was, um, they became a burnt offering, auto de fe. They uh, burned people up for that. Okay, just because people said that we weren't the center of the universe. Now it's this whole idea, some people don't like the idea that we shared the most recent common ancestor with um, uh, chimpanzees, with apes earlier than that. And how do you think the monkeys feel? <laughs> no, I mean, think about it. You, if you were a monkey, do you really think you'd want to be related to human beings? We have wars, we have all sorts of crazy ass things that we do. Of course, monkeys do too, but that's besides the point. Um, so, it's not like I'm ragging on religion. It's fine. You can have believe in religion um, and, and actually see that evolution is true. Um, and there's another thing. If you were to believe that, you know, God created the earth da, 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 in seven days, six days and then rested, um, that's a pretty that's a that's a pretty big insult to God's creation. I mean, if you look at the natural world out there. It's, it's far more meant fantastic than anything that you can actually read in the Bible. The Bible was written by people who were pre-scientific. They didn't know much. Okay? So, anyway, um, we'll stop there. But I want you to, re to watch that video. Because it's going to show you a lot of different examples of evidence for why, let's say, evolution is true. Now... Um, can anybody think of something that might suggest that there was evolution? Anybody? I just mentioned a few. Uh, huh? Yeah. I like some plants or fossils are similar in South America, Brazil specifically, kind of like match the ones in the west coast of Africa. Mm -hmm. And the Right. So not only does it an example of something that has seen us evolution, but also that the continents that we're on, they haven't been in the same place they've always that we thought. For the longest time geologists thought that in fact continents didn't move. Well it turns out they did. Yes? There are some genes that we still have but we don't move. Right, exactly. Um there's a gene actually um, if you actually look at our early embryo, there's a yolk sac, but there's no yolk in it for humans. And there's these genes that would have, that actually are there to create yolk, so that an embryo can live all of it. It doesn't need to anymore, but they're still there. Okay. So, um, there's a lot of, um, of reasons for, um, a lot of evidence for evolution. Um, now, this little chart here uh, shows three different hypotheses. So we're still back to you know the scientific method, right? So we just seen some evidence, like these genes that don't work anymore, fossils, all these things that suggest that and. The fact that some species look surprisingly similar to other species. Um, that all suggests that, you know, well, so you ask, are species changing? And then you come up with a hypothesis. Now, one of the hypotheses that was around for the longest time was this idea of separate, separate creation. God created each individual species. Um, for some reason, apparently God really likes beetles, because there's over a million species of beetles. But, um, and this was this idea that uh, when God makes things, he makes things perfectly. So separate creation. And those things were created 
And then um, they didn't change through time. In fact, if you actually, we'll look at this a little bit in a second here about where this came from, but that um, species were created and the kind of type for a species was perfection, and then that's why we actually have on the earth variation um, uh, or imperfection. Okay, so Good. okay, so this is separate creation. Now, there's also this idea that in fact evolution happened, but there was separate creation to begin with, and this is something that was believed um, just before Darwin that. In fact, species did change through time, and that's all evolution is, is a change through time in organisms. So we call this uh, transformation. And then evolution is simply that everything is related, has a common ancestor. And how do we perhaps know this? Well, all of life that we've ever found is made up of DNA or RNA. Okay? And it's the same genetic code. It codes for the same amino acids, the same proteins. So it's this universal genetic code. Now there's no real reason there are people now who are trying to make um, synthetic DNA with a different code. And then seeing if they can actually make an organism from that. Okay. So evolution, we usually have this branching pattern. This is what's called a phylogeny. Okay, um, okay, so this is a phylogeny, and it shows this branching pattern in terms of. Who, what things, what organisms are more closely related than others. It also shows, in fact, that there are certain lineages. Oh. Uh, that went extinct. Like this lineage. Uh, this lineage. This lineage. Okay? Now we're going to learn more about phylogenies in a second, but they actually show evolutionary relationships. Okay, so this idea of, um, so Plato, he had this idea of the imperfect ethos. Um, the allegory of the cave, anybody know what that is? What is it? Um, so it's a story where these people have lived in a cave all their life, just facing one direction, and they've seen like shadows pass by in the light. That's all they've seen because they're unable to like move their head anymore. Mm -hmm. And then one day, one of them gets free somehow, and he leaves the cave, and he sees all of these like amazing things, like camels and people, and Not just cloth of on the many, wall. yeah, cloth of many colors, things like that. And he goes back to the cave, and he tries to explain to the other people, but now he's just you know one of the background noises that they've heard all their lives, and he can't find a way to explain to them what they've seen. There's another seen. shadow. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, in Plato's time, there was um, the Earth, and then there was this um, other plane where um, all the different things that are, all the different rocks, and, and all the different animals, and all the different life forms were created, and they were perfect up there. But on the Earth here, you don't see that kind of perfection, you see a lot of variation. <coughs> So, in, in other words, variation is um, an evidence for imperfection, okay? Um, it's called typological thinking. In fact, it was, um, for the longest time, uh, that's how um, uh, people who look for similarities among living things, or even non-living things, um, thought that there's a perfect type species and you compare everything to that. Um, and then um, Aristotle had this great chain of being. Um,
and it's kind of like the ladder of um, intellect. And then at the very bottom we have something like stone, and then flame, and then finally plant, some, something alive, beasts, animals. Above beasts were, heaven, were humans, and then heaven, um, and then there were kind of angels or lesser gods, and then God finally at the very top, and then of course at the very, very, very top was Professor Beck. Okay? So, just want you to know, I love it when I get to play God. I, it's, it's the Napoleon complex in me. I've been looking for for a country with my own little army so I could go and conquer things. So, anyway, now I've actually got, I don't have a whole country, but I have a classroom and I can kind of lord it over you. No, I'm not going to do that. Okay. And then there was a guy named, um, oh, and then there was Judeo-Christian um, view of the world where like all these beautiful things in the world like adaptations and all that that was an <coughs> example of God's benevolence okay and then there was this guy in the um, 18th century named Carolus Linnaeus uh, who started um, looking at similarity among things and putting things together so Certain plants, there's different species that look similar to each other. Um, he actually put in botany um, plants and fungi together, even though fungi are much more closely related to us than they are to plants. It'd be hard to believe that, but it's true. Okay, so he had this first classification system. And then, in terms of uh, the history of um, evolutionary thought, there was this guy, uh, Georges Cuvier, Cuvier in, uh, in uh, Paris. And by this time, people were starting to find fossils. And he found that if you dug in the ground around Paris, it was in this kind of basin full of marine fossils. In other words, I mean, there were marine fossils everywhere. Okay? And now, he wasn't, in fact, he's part of the French Enlightenment, so... He wasn't a very religious man, but to him it looked like there was this catastrophic flood at one point that deposited all these marine organism fossils up there. And um, he came up with this idea of what's called catastrophism. In other words, catastrophic events that cause things to, like finding a whale bone up at uh, 20,000 feet in the Andes or something like that. Um, and then there was um, another French guy named Lamarck. Um, and he's, he's had the first theory of evolution. And he stated that, um, first of all, I believed in spontaneous generation. And then the inheritance of acquired characteristics through use and disuse. So in other words, if I... Well, here's these giraffes. And giraffes that kept stretching and stretching for higher and higher leaves, because let's say everybody else ate the lower ones, they would leave more offspring. And those offspring, because of all that use by those giraffes, would also have longer and longer necks, and they would stretch and then pass that on to their offspring. In other words, Lamarckian evolution is this idea that... Um, for example, I don't look like a bodybuilder, right? Well, let's say I was, and I got huge muscles. Couldn't put my arms all the way down. Um, I could press, you know, 500 pounds, whatever. And then if I had offspring, they would also have huge muscles. Okay? Not... Uh, now, there is inheritance of characters, but they're not acquired during a lifetime and then passed on. But anyway, a lot of people thought 
That sounded, that made a lot of sense. Uh, he wasn't entirely wrong, as we'll get to later, because it turns out gene regulation, um, what's called an epigenome, actually does change during our lifetime, but forget about that. And then, and then there was a guy named Charles Lyles, um, who was a friend of Darwin's. He was a geologist and had a huge effect as a mentor, of, but he didn't necessarily believe in evolution that Darwin presented, but he had a, a very sharp, open mind. Anyway, he, he, by a study with geology, he actually looked at stuff, and he thought, you know, the same processes, he was the first one to come up with an age of the universe that was older than 6,000 years. He, I think the first age of the, of the world was, for him, was like, at least a million years old, okay? And he kind of showed that the same processes that were used to be going on are still going on today. Volcanism happened in the past, still going on today. Erosion, still going on today. It's, it's, it's weird, you know, about erosion. I, I didn't, well, if you really want to understand a geological age, go to the Grand Canyon and then walk down it, and you'll be walking back through time. Um, and at the very bottom, you come to what's called this great in, um, um, nonconformity, where basically you go from some rock that's Cambrian age about 500 million years ago, and then all of a sudden, below that is rock that's like 1.5. Six billion years ago, where, where does all that go to? Well, it turns out there used to be mountains and continents, I mean, and rivers and, and deep canyons, and it all got washed away, eroded away. All you have to do is go out and look, and you can see that, first of all, gravity has an effect on erosion, and then water has an effect, uh, wind has an effect, the sheer weight of of gravity causing, has an effect. And so whole mountain ranges can like disappear. In fact, that's what's happening right now to the Appalachian Mountains. They used to be as tall as, as the Rockies. And the Rockies are eroding away too. And they're actually young, <coughs> um, older than the Sierras are. The Sierras are a uh, very young mountain range. And they're still eroding away. Okay, so erosion has this. Anyway, Charles Lyell realized and showed this, and he came. He came up with this idea of uniformitarianism, where the same things that were happening in the past, the same processes are happening now. And he also came up with this idea. There was a chapter in his book on geology about adaptation. He believed in adaptation, organisms fitting their environment and changing. But he didn't have this, this idea about um, um, ancestry instead of separate creation. He believed in separate creation initially. So, eventually, and by the way, ideas of evolution were really circulating. It wasn't like Darwin came up with these ideas de novo with no insight el from anyone else. Um, in fact, his, his grandfather, Erasmus Darwin, um, actually, it was a big topic in their household about the fact that it seemed like animals changed. And you can actually make animals change through time just uh, by um, selective <coughs> breeding and things like that. So he was a young fellow, and he went on this voyage. He was... Now, he was landed gentry, which means that he didn't have to work for his life, for his money. But it was thought at that time, you know, uh, even though he didn't have to work, he should do something productive. And he was uh, thinking of becoming a vicar. Anybody know what a vicar is? Oh, it's like a, like a priest. The vicar, Vicar Jones or something. So, um, anyway... He, he got really interested in um, zoology and geology and all that, and he was able to sign on to this voyage of the Beagle that went around the world. 
and you can actually see where it started um, up at Great Britain and then he went all the way across the Atlantic stopped at varied points along the South American coast collected fossils now he was a naturalist on the ship went all the way around um, uh, Cape uh, what is it um, anyway it's really cold down there and the winds are, tre are treacherous and they made it around and then they went up the west coast of South America um, Valparaiso in Chile, um, Cayo de uh, Lime, and then he also went to the Galapagos where he found Darwin's finches. And he collected all kinds of specimens to bring back. Um, and then he went back across the Pacific and then um, showed up. They went around Australia, around Africa. Uh, back to South America and then back across the Atlantic and up and it was a, a long voyage of a, I guess four or five years. <coughs> there we go. Okay. Now, there was also another fellow by the name of, um, of uh, Wallace um, and he was not landed dead gentry, but he was also interested in collecting stuff. And in fact, that's how he made his living. He went all over the world and collected things for rich patrons back in Great Britain and Europe. Um, Sir Alfred um, Russell Wallace. And um, first he went to South America and collected all these great things. And then he sent it all back on a ship, and unfortunately the ship sank. But then he went finally to the Malay Archipelago. Um, and he was the father of biogeography, which means that why do you find certain organisms in certain places and not others? And he showed, in fact, that what's now called the Wallace line, right here, separates um, flora and fauna, that means animals and plants, that seem more similar to those in Australia. And then also on this other side, that all these flora and fauna seem more similar to those in Southeast Asia. And they're very, very different. Um, in Australia, of course, and New Guinea, they have all these marsupials. Um, you don't really find very many marsupials in Southeast Asia. Whereas in Australia and New Guinea, that's all they have, except for dingo. But for the most part, that's the only kind of mammals they had, plus egg-laying mammals. So we came up with this line that, that is a deep trench, and it looked like a barrier to dispersal. Um, and it was here that he was collecting and making notes about all these different things, about where he was finding them, that he suddenly uh, realized that it looked like things were descended from common ancestors. <coughs> and uh, then that was in 1855, and then uh, right around 1859, he actually stumbled upon the same idea that Darwin had about um, evolution by natural selection. Um, now, uh, Darwin never wrote it up, but he, he has got he had some papers that he um, passed around from about 1840s with his ideas after his trip around the Galapagos and in realizing that all these different finches were related, and their closest relative was actually on the um, uh, South American coast. Okay. So, he was kind of a, a co-discoverer of evolution by natural selection. Now, what is evolution? Well, 
It's all really about sex and death. The whole shebang. That's all it is. Um, the idea is you want to have as much of the former while avoiding the latter. Now, of course, we can't completely avoid the latter, but <coughs> pretty much you want to leave as many offspring as possible. At least, in terms of evolution, the coin of the realm is passing your genes on from one individual to the next. That means you have to survive long enough to reproduce, and then reproduce successfully, and reproduce produce offspring that are um, also likely to reproduce successfully. Um, these are the things that our <coughs> evolutionary theory is, is um, interested in in terms of or obsessed with is sex and death. Well, if you actually look at religion, the same sort of things are going on. Um, religion is a, obsessed with sex and death. Who has sex with who? And then, of course, the fact that everybody dies on afterlife, right? So we're kind of obsessed about the same, same things. The only difference is that where I kind of study evolution, um, a lot of people, actually, religious people and others, they practice it. They leave lots of offspring. Nowadays, of course, people don't usually have 12 offspring. Um, or maybe less because the, um, the mother died in childbirth or something like that. Um, so, any, any ideas about what's evolution? You have an idea? How creatures turn into other forms of life. Okay. Okay. Another one? Does Anybody? What? Well, features of creatures. Uh, okay. How's that? That's good. Features of creatures change through time. Okay. Uh, anyone else with a yeah? How uh, organisms share a common ancestor? Okay. Good. Okay. Any others? Uh, the development of something. The what? The God will develop something. The de development of something? Okay. say of characters or features. Anything else? Yeah.
Okay. So I think the, the major thing that all of these definitions share in common is change through time. So here's some other definitions. Descent of modern organisms from pre-existing life forms that have become modified or changed over time. Um, and what's the cause of this change? For Darwin, the cause of this change in terms of like adaptation, what was that called? Natural selection. Natural selection. Okay. Now, are, that's fine. Don't worry. Now, are there other causes of evolutionary change that you can think of? Anyone? Adaptation. That's all part of natural selection. Something that has nothing to do with natural selection. How about mutation? Mutations arise, they're neither good nor bad. Sometimes they're beneficial, mostly they're uh, deleterious. So it, it turns out that, and Darwin remarked on this, that there were other reasons possibly for things happening. I mean, you could just have random events that cause change in a population that um, have nothing to do with how organisms respond. They all, let's say, go extinct. Um, or uh, there's a raccoon in the forest, a pine cone falls. It has nothing to do with the fact that this is a good uh, raccoon, leaves lots of offspring. He gets, he gets his cranium crushed by a big pine cone. That's a random event. It actually doesn't make him or the lineage that he represented it better or adapted. Like, let's say, a cheetah and a gazelle. So with a, a gazelle that's caught by a cheetah, that lineage and his whole family members, all that, the future ones, they're gone, right? Whereas other cheetah, other gazelles have actually, they can run faster. They can dodge cheetahs better. They leave more offspring. Now that's natural selection, but you can have just random events happening as well. Um, theory of that all organisms are related by common ancestry. Absolutely. And we already know this because, well, it looks like it anyway, that we all share the same DNA and our RNA code and the code of life. All organisms that we found. Doesn't mean that there hasn't been some other origin of life with a different um, code or some different um, something different than DNA. It's just that there might have been and it went extinct, or it might still be out there and we've never found it. <coughs> okay. And then the main thing is change in traits or genes, alleles. Now, alleles are different versions of the same gene. Um, some people have dark hair, some people have light hair because of different alleles that code for different proteins. Now, just so you know, genes do not code for traits. All they do is they code for proteins. That's it. No traits. It's those proteins that actually form various traits that we have, including, and we'll get to what that code does in terms of what's called a phenotype, which is our anatomy, physiology, behavior, development. Okay. And another thing that's important here is... Um, We're talking about, very importantly, okay, population. We're not talking about species, we're talking at the very most elementary level of population. And we've already talked a little bit about populations in terms of statistics and things like that. And then, um, here's a question for you. 
Are there any examples that you can think of where there's evolution, but not with biological things? The iPhone. What? The iPhone. The iPhone. Yeah, that's pretty good. That's brilliant. Actually, think about the phone. When it first showed up, Alexander Graham Bell, I'll get to you in a sec. Phone. And then uh, at one point you had to use this thing so you get the operator so she could connect you. Then there was a dial phone. Then there was a touch tone phone. Um, then there was a self, a, a phone you could actually carry in your hand. Then there was a phone that wasn't a phone anymore. It was all sorts of different things. Now, if you trace that, you look and you see that these different phones look similar to each other, except eventually there was this huge break with a cell phone, a, a small phone that you carried around. But there was a bigger version of that as well. And so that actually, um, you could say that phones evolve through time. Uh, did they evolve by chance, or do you think maybe selection? Why might you buy a certain phone? Anyone? Yeah. Yeah. Like, these have cool features. What about the ones that don't have those cool features? What happens to them? That's right, they go extinct. Okay? Um, same thing with cars. Right? Now, you might choose a car, let's say because you want to really drive fast, so you get a Lamborghini. Now, unfortunately, they're expensive. So, you choose a car based on expense. If you don't have, um, ex if you have unlimited expenses, you get Lamborghinis and all that kind of stuff. Otherwise, you get a sedan of, let's say, a Camry or something like that. Okay. What else? What other feature of a car would um, you purchase a car for? Efficiency. Fuel efficiency, right? So, and of course, then fashion. But that's kind of like the Lamborghini thing. So there's other things besides. Now, these are the things that we actually make. There are actually um, things we create. Ideas evolve too. They're called memes. Instead of genes, memes came from a guy named Dawkins. Um, and there's all kinds of memes. Um, let's see. Conspiracy theories are great for memes about, like, who conspired to um, fly planes into the World Trade Center. It wasn't um, Osama bin Laden. It was the Bush administration. All that kind of stuff. Those are ideas that can change over time. Of course, all the ideas that we that you go to school for, people have come up with little ideas, and we actually try and pass them along. Right? So ideas also change through time. Um, what were you going to ask before? Oh, I was going to add that, like architecture, like old buildings are easily uh -huh. destroyed by earthquakes and tornadoes, and so now they're improved. Like this is more exactly. Like, Right, so buildings that are suddenly fitted so that they can survive tornadoes and earthquakes and things like that. The ones that aren't fitted that way, what happens to them? They fall down. Okay, so there's lots of examples of things that evolve that are not biological in nature. I had this idea once about um, <clears throat> some friends of mine were doing logging on their ranch. And there's these uh, machines that look, that pick up logs and stack them on trucks. And they look like old kind of ancient bees. And I was just thinking that, um, let's say eventually machines take over and they uh, start finding these things you know, encased in rock. And they go, 
some of them think, well, it was created by someone else. These things that were made of steel encased in rock. And then there were other people who said, but look at how they've changed through time. Who's right? I'm not suggesting that, you know, there's creationism. Of course, in that case, you could see it's kind of like a weird mind game where, you know, you'd find this, this old tractor encased in rock, and, um, you know, it looks like someone actually made it. And that was one of the reasons why people thought that God created everything, because some things are so well adapted, they're just beautifully adapted toward their environment. So, what, what predictions um, does uh, evolution by natural selection make? Well, you should be able to find examples of change in populations or higher taxes through time. In fact, you should be able to even find it happening right now. Now, of course, some things have very long generation times, but let's say bacteria evolving, let's say, resistance. More closely related taxa will share more traits or alleles in common than the less related uh, taxa. A taxa is any sort of unit, whether it's a population, a species, uh, in the old nomenclature, genus, class, order, um, kingdom, you know, all that. Okay? <coughs> Um, common ancestry. A lot of times, why do we find tra uh, certain organisms in certain places and not others? Well, there's two ways to get to somewhere. One is your ancestors lived there in the beginning, or subsequently um, there was a dispersal event that got an organism to a new place, like um, some of the birds in Hawaii actually flew across the ocean. Um, if you look at the fossil record, you always find certain organisms, like in the very beginning, the earliest organisms were, it looks like they're, um, they were called blue green algae, but they're actually cyanobacteria, um, and, um, you find evidence of them in rock that is like three and a half billion years old. And it wasn't until much later, about 700 million years ago, that the first multicellular organisms were actually found. And then it wasn't until um, 540 million years ago that the first vertebrates or early chordates were found. So in other words, the Devonian is like 390 million or 400 million years ago. There were no mammals then. If you actually found a bunny, a bunny rabbit, in a Devonian uh, formation, there'd be a problem with the theory of evolution. Um, something called homology. Homo, same. And anybody know what homology means? Okay. Anybody know what an analogy is compared to um, analogy? Any, anybody? Analogy. What's an analogy? Something is like something else. Well, what a homology does is it shows that it's like something else because it was inherited from that something else. Okay? So, it didn't just get those new things that actually inherited them. Those are called homologies. Vestigial traits. Talk a little bit about that. Um, are traits like um, our tailbone, um, something called lanago that's all covering our bodies, um, that you actually find in embryology. Those are vestigial or tray or like little tiny uh, leg uh, limb buds in whales and snakes. 
those are traits that are no longer useful or traits that are, in fact, now maladaptive. Like people tra uh, choke on food because we inherited, um, well, our, our ancestors had a swim bladder that evolved into a lung, but for some reason, um, the designer crossed the paths of what you take in with your mouth to eat as well as as well as breathing, and it goes down the wrong spot. Transitional forms. Um, you find, uh, let's say, what looks like um, something that is related to another that's kind of in between, like uh, a whole series of organisms that kind of have bird-like features but weren't actually birds. Um, the sensor the central common answer affects how lineages evolve through time, what you would expect. And new species formation, that sort of stuff. Okay. Now, Darwin and Wallace, they came up with two great ideas. Evolution by natural selection, which is a process and descent from a common ancestor, and those descendants have been modified. Those are the two great ideas that both Darwin a little bit earlier and Wallace came up with. If you get out of this class and that's the only thing you remember, that's good enough. Okay? Really. These were, um, these were revolutionary ideas and um, at the time, um, and still are if you actually look at it. Um, this is what Darwin wrote at the end of his great opus on the origin of the species. This is the last paragraph. I'm not going to read it here, but it's a pretty nice paragraph. <coughs> Okay. Now, we've got some words here that are kind of important. Mutation. Everybody know what a mutation is? Anybody doesn't know what a mutation is? What is a mutation? Where does it occur? In genes. Okay. And then uh, it, these mutations happen in individuals, either in their germline cells where they're creating sperm and eggs, and sometimes there's a change in the, some of the genes, so there's uh, different lettering there. And then these mutations invade a population of organisms that share all those genes. And then new genes enter, old genes exit. Most genes, most variants of genes actually probably go extinct or don't have any effect at all. And then there's something called allelic or allele, we'll just say. And an allele is just a variant of a gene. So it turns out that uh, um, genes code for proteins. Actually, they code for amino acids, which are strung together. And so the genetic code, there's four genetic letters that we'll learn about. And um, when you get three of them in a row, they code, that's called a codon, and they code for an amino acid. And if you change one of the letters, CG, a and T, from one thing to another. Let's say you have um, a codon that says TTG, and um, the T in the middle, the second one, turns into an A. So now you have TAG. 
that is likely to um, meet that's a mutation, and that is an annual allele. If it's a beneficial allele, it'll spread through the population. In other words, individuals who have that change will leave more offspring than those that don't. And so you have these alleles, which are different versions. And it turns out that we all get two alleles for each gene because we're diploid. We get one allele from our mama, one allele from our papa. So you have a bunch of chromosomes that are um, homologous chromosomes. You get one of them from your mom, one of them from your pa. And then populations change through time. Certain, uh, let's say, alleles that maybe were favorable under one environment are no longer, and they disappear from the population. So, changing in the frequency of certain alleles or variants of genes through time, that's what evolution does at the micro scale, microevolution. Okay, so essential concepts again. Um, what's an allele? It's a gene variant. What's the gene pool? Well, you think of the gene pool is all the alleles. That means each person has two alleles. Sometimes there's the same allele, sometimes there's different. You put them into a, a gene pool, that means from a whole population. And so you have these, um, some are orange, some are blue. <coughs> and then there's also something called a genotype. So because we have two alleles of everything, in a real simple model, you might have allele A1 and allele A2. Well, A1, A1 means that you end up with a blue chicken. Okay? Now, that blue <laughs> chicken, the chicken itself, that's the phenotype of the organism. In, in other words, the anatomy of the organism, the physiology of the organism, how the organism develops <coughs> over time, how the organism behaves. Okay? So you have behavioral phenotypes. So in this case, if you have two alleles, um, A1, A1, let's say it's 25%, A1, A2, that means they're heterozygous. Uh. Go. Mm. Oh well. Anyway, it says heterozygous. Um, homozygous means they have the same allele. So the same allele from mother and from father. Okay. So those are genotypes. And then phenotypes are, in fact. The anatomy and physiology. And so what normally happens is you end up with a gene that codes for certain proteins plus those coded proteins might change depending on the environment with more one and then another and then you end up with this phenotype of an organism whether it's a bacteria or a human being. Okay, We all have phenotypes. Okay, um, let's go...